What's up, guys? It is Thursday, October 20th. It's 1234 p.m., and this is the newsletter. So we're going to dive into this article. Determining which assets are safe havens in traditional markets is relatively simple, but figuring out which crypto assets to flee to during market turbulence requires a new way of thinking. So crypto failures field better due diligence. So let's see what this is all about. And as crypto markets turn turbulent, asset managers perform due diligence by looking at fundamentals like network user usership to increase safety. And it just makes sense. Crypto is here to stay. Digital assets here to stay. Tokenization of all uh, all things is well on its way and happening as we speak. So with this uncertainty in the macro environment, it's really like that, like these smart money institutional investors asset managers they know crypto and digital assets are here to stay now they really have to avoid the speculation side of things and really just like dig into the fundamentals of these protocols and see the usership see the use case and the solution that that digital asset is offering and by looking at that they're really analyzing the protocol and the ecosystem and finding value in that rather than speculation in the price. Big asset managers, institutional investors, they don't care about the price at that very moment if something's skyrocketing, anything like that. They're looking at the fundamentals of digital assets, the ecosystem, the protocol, and seeing if that's getting traction and the market opportunity and market potential of that. How much of that market can they swallow up and what's the percentage that they can kind of gain market dominance of that and what does that look like is it a trillions of dollar market that they can get 10 percent of market dominance of or are we talking quadrillions like the derivative market so that's what they're looking at and you can see recent events have caused participants in the crypto sector to not only recognize the value of due diligence, but also to revisit how they perform due diligence on digital assets. So during this early stage of the market maturing, there's going to be so many variations and new ways of valuing digital assets. There still isn't a like proper way to value a digital asset or a blockchain based system. But as time moves on, there's going to be figuring it out, tailoring of it. And really, if you just look at the utility of that network and the traction and the partners and the utilization of that, that DLT network and having that digital asset be an integral part of that network, then usually it will work out. It's good. So that is that. And now let's keep going. So the OECD has launched an international tax reporting framework for crypto that includes stable coins, crypto derivatives, and certain NFTs in its scope. So let's see about this. So the framework scope, yep, yeah, okay. So the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development has released its new tax reporting framework, the Crypto Asset Reporting Framework. The framework, which is approved in August, ensures the collection and automatic exchange of information on transactions for relevant crypto. The definition of crypto assets includes Assets that can be held and transferred in a decentralized manner without the intervention of traditional financial intermediaries, including stablecoins, derivatives issued in the form of a crypto asset, and certain non-fungible tokens. The current scope of assets, as well as the scope of obliged entities covered by the common reporting standard, do not provide tax administrations with adequate visibility on when taxpayers engage in tax-relevant transactions in or hold relevant crypto assets. So they created this new framework to combat that. And let's see, um, work is ongoing on an implementation package to ensure the consistent domestic and international application of this um, new framework. So we can keep going. And we had saw in uh, one of my last videos that their Senator or Rep Representative Mooney is looking to define the dollar as a fixed weight of gold for other per and for other purposes, bringing back the gold standard. We had covered that in a uh, video the past week. Now, City to launch 24-7 clearing in quarter four 2022, working across clients' channels of choice, starting with Swift and soon via API. City is an XRP-enabled network, and we know from uh, they were exper experimenting with Ripple technology. You can see Volante and talking about what City will be building its core ISO 222 capability using Volante's Volpay for ISO 222 migration solution. And we know that Volante was the chosen partner for the FedNow service. And that Volante has XRP on-demand liquidity 
able to be used within their system. And then you can see City. This is somebody head of application development for WorldLink, global cross currency with foreign exchange experimentation project with stack like Ripple Labs, Hyperledger, Chain.com. I was actually wanted to do a deep dive on Chain. I really don't feel as if anybody talks about it. I haven't really seen anybody mention Chain XCN and how big that coin could be. So I'm going to do a deep dive on Chain to bring awareness to it because everywhere I've seen when it comes to institutional adoption of crypto or tokenization, Chain has been there. And I'm going to uh, do a whole separate video and show you guys throughout all the years where Chain has popped up and do a deep dive on that. So we can keep moving and we can see that what's next for the G20 roadmap for enhancing cross-border payments. The Financial Stability Board has published priorities for the next phase in coordinate, coordination with the Bank of International Settlements Committee on Payments and Market Infrastructures. So let's go into this. So FSB Financial Stability Board outlines next step for enhancing cross-border payments. Today published the priority themes for the next phase of work under the G20 roadmap for enhancing cross-border payments. Two years after the roadmap was launched, the plan includes the practical steps to be taken to strengthen external engagement during this next phase of work. We can see that they, the initial work on the roadmap in 2021-2022 has focused on laying the foundations through the necessary stock takes and analysis. The roadmap has now reached an inflection point and needs to move to practical initiatives to enhance payment arrangements. The FSB, the Bank for International Settlements, and partner bodies have therefore begun to focus and prioritize future work, drawing from the analysis to date and the feedback received from stakeholders. So the themes are payment system interoperability and extension, legal, regulatory, and supervisory frameworks, and cross-border data exchange and message standards. So under the prioritization, work will be focused on initiatives that help to achieve the roadmap targets for enhancing the cost, speed, access, transparency of cross-border payments. By placing this at the center of its planning, the public and private sector can direct resources toward the work most likely to have the biggest impact by the 2027 target date. The FSB will hold a high-level cross-border payments summit in October 2022 to launch the new phase of work under the roadmap, bringing together leaders from both the private and public sector. And today's note on prioritization, the way forward sets out how these practical tools can be leveraged for action in support of the G20's 2027 targets. And let's see if there's anything else. So the FSB will publish an update on its planned framework for monitoring progress towards the G20 targets for cross-border payments in November. The FSB coordinates at the international level the work of national financial authorities and international standard setting bodies and develops and promotes the implementation of effective regulatory, supervisory, and other financial sector policies in the interests of financial stability. And you can see a lot of people involved in that. So things are moving forward as far as enhancing cross-border payments on a global level. Now we got, with the climate provisions of recent U.S. legislation in hand, I'm as optimistic as ever about deep decarbonization. But unless we ex act Unless we address widespread integration issues, the grid won't be able to handle what is coming. The Inflation Reduction Act supercharged the energy transition. This year's Inflation Reduction Act represented the U.S. largest ever budget commitment to addressing climate change with a historic $391 billion pledged to a broad range of clean energy and electrification initiatives. So let's see what Energy Web is talking about. So as... Going through this article, it says, but at a system level, this model has painful consequences. So basically, they're saying they need to update the grid and grid safety, reliability, and utilizing emerging technologies and building the digital infrastructure needed to smartly coordinate these assets simply isn't present on grids yet, but that's what they're trying to do. So I looked into this US FERC's order 2222, and this is what it brought up. And it was released September 17, 2020. And it says FERC opens wholesale markets to distributed resources. Landmark action breaks down barriers to emerging technologies, boosts competition. The Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, FERC, today approved a historic final rule, Order 2222, enabling distributed energy resource, DER, aggregators to complete an all regional organized wholesale electric markets. This bold action empowers new technologies to come online and participate on a level playing field, one of our keywords, further enhancing competition, encouraging innovation, and driving down costs for consumers. 
Distributed energy resources are located on the distribution system, a distribution subsystem, or behind a customer meter. They range from electrical storage and intermittent generation to distributed generation, demand response, energy efficiency, thermal storage, and electric vehicles and their charging equipment. The final rule enables these resources to participate in the regional organized wholesale capacity, energy, and ancillary services markets alongside traditional resources. Multiple distributed energy resources can aggregate to satisfy minimum size and performance requirements that they might not meet individually. So we can keep going through here. And it, yeah, so like they've been plotting this out for a while now. And they have, like, this was approved. At the beginning of like 2021, because it said enacted 90 days after publication. So with it, yeah. So that's basically it. Like they are really updating the grid and updating everything and enhancing it to a distributed type of way and upgrading everything to be able to handle a full interoperable ecosystem between the financial system, the energy industry, and just everything else. Everything's going to interoperate with each other. Then we can go to the top IMF's official comments might be relevant to Bitcoin traders since the largest cryptocurrencies have proven to be correlated with the dollar strengths in foreign exchange markets. So the IMF's Georgieva warns central banks to hoard reserves, follow follow Fed hikes. The official comments might be relevant. All right, so let's go here. The head of the International Monetary Fund said Wednesday, central banks should refrain from currency interventions. Instead, suggesting they use interest rate raises as the preferred tool for combating foreign exchange weaknesses versus the dollar. Do not waste your reserves to protect your currency. When your currency is depreciating because of this mismatch of fundamentals, if you throw your reserves to defend it, the only thing you'll get out of it is a weak position for the future. Emerging market currencies have been roiled by a strengthening in dollar as the Federal Reserve raises interest rates to combat rising consumer prices in the U.S. Because so many countries are dependent on imports, higher local prices for international goods, often denominated in dollars, have triggered bouts of inflation around the world. A stronger dollar also makes it harder for emerging market countries to repay dollar-denominated debt because taxes are usually assessed in the local currency. So do not fight a battle you cannot win, she says. She noted that some countries have raised their interest rates to stay in lockstep with the Fed's hikes. In general, when a country has a higher interest rate, its domestic bonds are more attractive to global investors, a dynamic that in turn leads to a stronger exchange rate. The Bank of Mexico raised its interest rate for an 11th time in September to attempt to range in 8.5% to 9.25%. And the Mexican peso has held up much stronger against the US dollar than other emerging market currencies. We have actually seen a number of emerging markets that have been quite proactive to assess the direction that the economy was taking and increase interest rates before the Fed. Actually, what she's saying is very important. She is basically arguing that the Fed will not ease and that the dollar will continue to rise. So do not fight a battle you cannot win. Because the US dollar is the world's reserve currency, the Federal Reserve is by default the central banker to the world. Which means that if the Fed tightens, all other major central banks must follow suit if they want their country's currency to remain on the same level as the dollar. The perplexing question of how central banks respond to a strong dollar could become a factor in crypto markets if indirectly. Bitcoin is inversely cor- correlated with the dollar strength in foreign exchange markets. So if central banks fight back against their weakening foreign exchange rates, the cryptocurrency might benefit. There's also speculation going back years in crypto circles that people in emerging markets might turn to digital assets like Bitcoin as a safe haven if they're seeing high inflation or economic turmoil in their home countries. There we go. Because my thought process is like, this is the world as of today. And you have all these different fiat currencies. And if the dollar is rising and all these, like like the pound is like depreciating intensely and all these currencies are depreciating and like the only choice is the dollar, but we know eventually the dollar is going to fold over and not be the world reserve currency anymore. I'm thinking about it like XRP and even XLM, it's like you're owning a currency that is limited in supply. There can't be more of it that can be converted into any currency, any commodity, any financial instrument that's tokenized or asset that's tokenized. So by owning XRP, you virtually in the future, because right now it's not prevalent, but as the market grows, as XRP chairs and Ripple and all this case stuff is over, in the future, I believe XRP, by owning it, you're going to own 
a scarce, one of the scarcest assets that will be convertible into anything and everything. So by owning XRP, you own everything in a sense. That's how I'm thinking about it. And that's why I'm going to continue to stack XRP, XLM, because I do believe those cryptos or digital assets are like currencies that can be converted into any other currency. It's like a fluid currency. Rather, rather, if you have the dollar, you got the dollar, you know, but if you have XRP, you can swap into virtually anything, commodities, stocks, other currencies, etc. So XDC is actually now supported by Ledger and you can now withdraw and deposit XDC on Uphold. So that's very good to know. So now you can secure your XDC if you're holding it on Uphold, you can withdraw it out to your Ledger and hold it there. That makes it much easier. Then we got Tether reducing their commercial holding backing to zero. And then we had Swift Hackathon 2022 winners, BNY Mellon and Exact Pro, who were announced yesterday at Cybos. And then the chairman of the SEC, Gary Gensler, said the CFTC should be given more power to police stable coins. So the CFTC, Gensler pointed out that the CFTC does not have direct authority to write rules for the firms that issue stable coins, but should get more power to oversee them. So he said that the CFTC should be given more authority to please stable coins. He argued that stable coins are very similar to money markets and should be regulated accordingly. And while the CFTC has regulatory authority over dollar backed stable coin issuers in the areas of fraud and manipulation, it doesn't have direct regulatory authority regulatory authorities over the underlying non-security tokens. Momentum in Congress is gaining to make the CFTC the regulator of the spot markets for tokens that aren't considered security, such as Bitcoin, while the SEC would oversee those cryptocurrencies that are considered securities. So you're going to have cryptocurrencies, crypto commodities, and crypto securities. That's how I see it playing out. So the FTX proposal for clearing customers' crypto derivatives trading has the CFTC spouting words like evolution and disruption and says it's a potential evolution in the way that the market structure is and like replacing that plumbing. So clearing certain crypto derivatives without intermediaries is still being weighed and would mark a significant shift. And it's the first step, but like, and if they're doing it in a crypto sense, so like the proposal to cut out the middlemen in the US crypto derivatives has shaken traditional financial firms. So they're gonna start off maybe by doing uh, having DLT and uh, replace the market infrastructure for the um, de- crypto derivatives. But eventually the end goal is to replace the the plumbing of the traditional derivative space, which is quadrillions of dollars. And we read the thing about Kendra Hill, who had said XRP is going to p- be positioned to be a digital store of value of digital gold, as well as be that settlement mechanism for the derivatives market and handle a hundred percent of the volume through it, which is quadrillions of dollars. So this is like the narrative being built. No intermediated intermediated futures would be a significant deal. It's a significant shift. He want, he went on to describe how crypto natives come into the long established industry and are surprised by what, by what they find. They come into the traditional market space and they're just a bit puzzled. They're like, why do you do it this way? Why We have a way that's more efficient where we can have a trading execution that's quicker with better pricing and we can have settlement and custody in a much better manner. That's where I think we have to learn from each other collectively. The application process seems to be going well. Okay. Yeah. And that's when I used to work at Fidelity, I was well into crypto before joining Fidelity. And when I was, you know, buying and selling on Coinbase and other platforms, it was instant. There was no like, settlement times and waiting a couple of days for the stock or the crypto to settle and then you can trade again, etc. It was just instant. So that's how I thought all, you know, trading financial instruments were until I joined Fidelity and we had to learn about transaction plus two. So T plus two settlement time, T plus one. And the settlement wasn't instant. It would take a couple of days and I'd, I'd have customers calling in saying, hey, where's my money? I can't, you know, buy this stock. Like I just sold this the other day. And I remember the first time doing it, I was like, huh, that's weird. Like, I'm not sure. Let me look into it. And that's because I didn't realize how slow and clunky the system, the traditional system was because I was so just like from the jump in crypto. So it was like, oh, well, this must be the norm until I joined the traditional aspect of things and realized, wow, 
crypto and blockchain are really going to uh, revolutionize this stuff. And they're, they're slow to the jump here. And that's why I left because I was like, all these things are teaching us and like training, uh, training on us right now. In a couple of years, we're not even going to have to worry about it because blockchain is going to be the new plumbing and the underpinning of the system. Whereas like settlement times, things like that, they're going to be non-existent. It's going to be instant settlement, real-time settlement. And that's going to make everything much more liquid and money to be able to flow faster. And that just spurs more economic activity. All right, let's keep going. So CFTC commissioner to pitch retail investor definition to get set to get set for new regulation or new oversight to get set for crypto. Commissioner Christy Goldsmith Romero says that agency needs a new way of categorizing investors as it prepares for new digital assets oversight. So it's kind of set in stone that the CFTC is going to have a role in regulating the spot market. It's kind of like they're all saying it at this point now. So they're looking to redefine how it sets rules for retail investors now that the agency seems likely to take an oversight of spot crypto trading. She intends to propose a new retail investor definition, and she'll start with an informal concept posted on the agency's website asking for people to weigh in. We got more retail investors coming into our markets that traditionally have been largely institutional. The current way the CFTC thinks of a retail investor is so wide and includes just regular people all the way up to somebody with $10 million. Adding a newly defined category could help the agency treat regular crypto users differently under the rules than the large institutions, and that would typically mean more limits and protections for the small-scale investors. You want to make sure that you can provide expanded access to retail investors, but in a way that's safe and affordable for them, which might look very different than how the institutions or how a high net worth individual might purchase. The CFTC is so far looking, so far looking most likely to be the primary regulator for crypto trading, according to various bills winding through Congress that would give it the authority over the spot market. So um, the CFTC's sister agency, the SEC, has long maintained a shifting definition of what makes an accredited investor who isn't thought to need as many protection as mom and pop investors. I'm happy to listen to all that, try to get it right. I'm just throwing out a concept of something that I think is not quite set up right. Our definition of retail really doesn't work for this asset class. So there's a whole fundamental shift now with crypto, a new way of looking at everything the system in the system. And really, uh, it's opening up these regulators' eyes and the traditional uh, kind of regulators and just uh, people in the industry, getting them to approach things differently because crypto and blockchain are giving this new paradigm of like decentralization over centralization type of mindset. So now that the lawmakers, regulators, etc., have to look at things in that light now going forward. So Bank of International Settlements, introducing a CBDC is not a universal solution. It has to come in a package with digital and financial literacy and identity, among other things. For that, public and private sectors have to work together. Let's see what this is about. Oh, I don't think there's a link here, but... And then Balmain, introducing the Balmain thread, our vision for driving fashion into the Web3 future imagined in collaboration with Mint NFT official and Ripple built on the XRP ledger. So Balmain is doing NFTs on the XRP ledger. And then this was huge news, introducing the first phase of bringing an Ethereum virtual machine EVM sidechain to the XRP ledger. EVM developers, we invite you to experiment with the functionality on DevNet and enjoy the best of Ethereum and XRPL for your DeFi applications. So that's huge news like the more that ripple and xrp can expand its capabilities and tap into like ethereum that's definitely good because a lot of people think of ethereum as the one-stop shop that's the one that's going to make it so and that's what's being currently used right now by a ton of people and for nfts so by hooking up with them and adding that capability it just makes it that much easier for people to make the switch over to realize that xrp and ripple are the one now let's go to, yep, so Ripple is testing a way for developers to deploy smart contracts made for the larger and more popular Ethereum on its XRP ledger blockchain with little effort. So just ease of use. That's what we need for mainstream adoption. Fidelity will allow institutions to buy, sell, and trade Ethereum on its crypto platform starting October 28th. And then Tesla makes no changes to its Bitcoin holdings in third quarter, so they didn't sell anything. And then we got... And this is what we were talking about earlier about the values in the network and the protocol. So there's a lot of networks out there, but there's not there's not a good protocol to connect them all together until now. 
He explains how his team plans to use, okay, to bridge the debt markets to crypto. The SEC holds a paternalistic belief that the agency knows better than investors. So let's see what this is saying. So Coinbase and Blockchain Association have both filed amicus briefs as the lawsuit against the commission moves forward. U.S. Chamber of Commerce calls it SEC's actions freewheeling private policymaking. Agency's denial of GBTC's conversion to ETF makes little sense when considering SEC, SEC approved a spot, Palladium ETP Blockchain Association says. So yeah, they're going after the SEC. SEC is under a lot of heat right now. It's like so much negative stuff coming out about them. Then the iOS CEO's new chairman will be joined by CFTC as the vice chair, putting a central figure in the U.S. crypto policy debate in a prominent role for setting international standards. So international securities regulator, iOS CEO, appoints the CFTC, this guy, at the center of the U.S. policy debate. So we'll see how that shapes out. Then we can keep going forward and see that anti-fraud and fintech experts told UK lawmakers who are considering eagerly awaited stablecoin laws to consider the industry's competitiveness during a hearing today. Protections are needed, they said, for uh, so Bank of England must consider private stablecoins developing digital pound, address lawmakers on a committee that is weighing a bill that would regulate the coins. Bank of England must take account of the crypto industry's competitiveness when it decides how to issue a central bank digital currency and talks about and warns of risks of fraud from coin swaps and blockchain bridges as they deliberate on the UK's financial services and markets bill. There's a question whether we could apply a competition objective to the Bank of England where we think about things like central bank digital currency and how that's implemented. He added that he added that CBDC could crowd out innovation in stablecoins unless it's designed in a way that promotes competition by enabling a level playing field, right? So the bill, which was introduced by the government in July, would ensure that the Financial Conduct Authority considers the country's economic growth and international competitiveness when creating rules for the crypto sector. And the bill also sets eagerly awaited rules to ensure stablecoins, crypto assets whose value is tied to existing fiat currencies, can be used as a payment and is being scrutinized by lawmakers in the House of Commons. Talks about the UK isn't going as far as rival jurisdictions such as the EU, which is regulating a much broader set of private digital asset providers under its recently enacted MICA regulation and that the UK bill as drafted isn't even clear about its own scope. The government has said before that they will be bringing forward proposals for wider regulation of other crypto assets, but said further legal advice is needed on whether the bill as it stands gives the government the authority to do so. Already, we're looking at money laundering through coin swap services, which don't need an account and may not be under this regulation. And yeah, so there we go. So that is going to be um, between now and November 3rd that they're going to proceed to a clause by clause reading of the bill. This was big. South Africa has declared crypto assets to be a financial product, bringing them more under the purview of the country's regulators. So South Africa has declared crypto assets to be a financial product. The change brings digital assets under the purview of South Africa's regulators. The notice defines a crypto asset as a digital representation of value that is not issued by a central bank, but can be traded, transferred, or stored electronically for the purpose of payment, investment, and other forms of utility. The change, which takes effect immediately and falls under the Financial Advisory and Intermediary Services Act 2022, comes as countries around the world are moving to regulate cryptocurrencies more strictly, particularly amid the recent volatility in prices and the collapse of several important crypto firms. The Deputy Governor of South Africa Central Bank said this summer the bank had come to view cryptocurrencies as a financial asset and was looking into regulating the sector. So now it was immediate. Now they're digital assets. That's the new word. The, U- the U.S. IRS has made a move to clarify at least one question for crypto investors, how taxpayers account for NFT. So right there. And then MasterCard is long on the metaverse. The metaverse is still being developed, but its challenges and social impacts are already being considered today. Yeah, the metaverse is going to take some time to play out, I think. Then we have France's AMF. I- I'm not sure what this is. I think it's their financial markets authority. Warns the country's registration regime for crypto firms is winding down to make way for the European Union's MICA framework. So... I think that they're going to be kind of adopting the MICA framework. So the country's financial markets authority is also looking for entities willing to test out DLT-based securities trading. So crypto companies operating in France were urged to prepare for tough European Union standards by a senior official from the country's AMF on Wednesday. 
So they're going to be winding down its lighter national registration regime for crypto service providers. As of 2024, the system will be replaced by the EU markets and crypto assets, the MICA framework, which goes much further than the anti-money laundering checks currently carried out by France to include guarantees intended to ensure investor protection, market integrity, and financial stability. So I feel as if there's going to be a global global coordinated regulation of crypto. And maybe it's at that G7 or I think there's a conference coming up in November. All right, let's keep going. So Japan to further relax crypto rules by easing listings of tokens. JP Morgan appoints former Celsius executive as crypto regulatory policy. Of course they do. The UK government may upend centuries-old legal norms in its quest to clear create clear rules for crypto. The Law Commission of England and Wales is exploring how digital assets should be treated under existing and new legislation, and its suggestions may upend centuries-old legal norms. You can see um, that about two-thirds of the commission's work ends up being implemented by the UK Parliament. The commission's work can have influence in other jurisdictions as well. In cases where the US doesn't have legal precedence, the courts may consider the commission's consultation paper on digital assets. According to U.S. Judge Martin Glenn, who is currently overseeing the bankruptcy proceedings for crypto land of Celsius, but the U.K. government set for now at least on turning the country into an international hub for crypto, the Law Commission's projects may not, may not only be important but also urgent. And the uh, the law is going to look at running multiple projects focused on the crypto space to determine the best ways to treat Web three developments like DAOs, digital assets under new or existing laws, and how it can be applied to smart contracts that underlie crypto transactions, how existing laws, law contract can be applied to that, is also working on a conflict of laws project, exploring how to determine which court should handle digital asset disputes because of their global nature. Recently, the, yeah, so that's kind of laying it out right there. There needs to be a global governing body for crypto since crypto is worldwide. So like, that's how it it's going to happen. They're, they're going to have to. Then you can see Israel to test blockchain-based bonds. So blockchain-based digital bonds. Israel to test that. A joint effort by the Israeli government and the country stock exchange will assess distributed ledger technology for debt issuance. The thing about it is it's like, you know, there can never, like debt is limitless. They can issue debt, debt, debt. So like if there is a token that's the underlying kind of, is underlying the issuance or like the, uh, is the underlying protocol of where, which they could launch these digital bonds and issue them. Like the sky's the limit because bonds do not have, I mean, yeah, debt can just keep going on and on and on. And the thing is when you have a digital asset that's limited in supply, like, and there there's more of debt being issued then the price of that digital asset that's limited in supply needs to go up to compensate for that supply and demand type of balancing of the scales. So the concept will include the digitization of a series of government debt to be issued to select participants. The private permission blockchain is compatible with the EVM, their virtual machine. They're planning to test blockchain-based digital bonds as it seeks to modernize financial market processes and reduce associated costs. Will issue bonds via a permission private distributed ledger technology platform being ready for live testing. And digital asset infrastructure and custody solutions provider Fireblocks and the US based cloud computing tech firm VMware will assist in the technical execution of the platform. Tokenized bonds will be sent to participants' digital wallets, while the issuance consideration and digital currency will be transferred from the participants to the state of Israeli's own wallet. The pilot project will begin within the next few days and is expected to be completed by the end of the first quarter of 2023. There we go. Following the first DLT bond issued in 2018 by the World Bank, I didn't know about that, TASE and the ministry said they had been following developments in the financial markets, including tokenizing various assets, DLT-based bonds, let's see what else, debt instruments, The financial markets are undergoing drastic transformations in recent years. We hope to see Israel spearhead financial technology while being the first to implement cutting edge technologies and upgrade the capital market. All the money, all the money. Now let's keep going. So HBAR staking has arrived, native HBAR staking through I think Blade Wallet, Hashpack app. You can actually go, 
I think I have hash pack. Now you can stake your H bar. Why not? If you're holding it for the long term and they're not looking to sell it, might as well stake it, earn some interest. Then the ECB's T2 ISO 222 postponement is causing a massive dislocation. Now SWIFT wants to check the impact of the CBPR plus ISO 222 deadline quote in light of the ECB's announcement, we will leverage this planning, validate with our global community, and within one week, either reconfirm or revise the planned start date of the cross-border ISO 222 migration. So nothing on Swift's website about it. It's because now Swift has gated the, the timeline. They gated the timeline and these things, but thank God for this person or whatever. Yeah. They, they, I guess have access only visible for Swift member institutions. I think maybe they have access. So that I'm still looking to break this down and see what this all means. So I'm not going to say, I know, Oh, well, this is good. This is bad. I need to really dive into this, see what this means. So just wanted to put it on your radar though. Then we got Digital Pound Foundation. Stable coins could have such a profound effect on the established banking system that U.S. regulators need to require that the digital tokens fit in without disrupting it, the acting chairman of the FDIC government said. And then we're, the Flare project will airdrop the Flare token to XRP holders between October 24th and November 6th. It's been a while. So nearly two years after the XRP snapshot, so in 2020, if you held XRP around this time for that snapshot, we'll be getting the Flare token um, in a couple of weeks here. Then BlackRock, BNY Mellon, Fidelity, name a few. Let's hear this. Institutions, you know, Joey and I sat in a meeting not that long ago with, you know, some of the, the, the largest institutional money in the world trying to get smart about crypto. They owned zero on that day. I don't know if they do today. But as they enter the market, you have fixed supply, increasing demand. You don't have to go to MIT to know what's going to happen. Institutions, you know, Joe. And that's what I just said a little bit earlier. Fixed supply, increasing demand. You don't got to go to MIT to know what's going to happen. Price needs to catch up to reflect and compensate for that balancing of the scales between demand, supply, price. There we go. Things XRP will do, payments, interoperability, mint NFTs, trade finance, tokenized assets, settlements. When do you realize all the money means everything else becomes pointless? Time will reveal all. And that's a fact. And that's what I'm going to wrap it up with. Actually, I'm going to wrap it up with this because you might want to take notice of this one. Ripple to meet with the SEC today to talk settlement. Here's the description of the meeting that will be held. Cross your fingers and your toes. The general counsel of the commission or his designee has cert certified that in his opinion, one or more of the exemptions set forth in the whatever that is, permit consideration of the scheduled matters at this closed meeting. The subject matter of the closed meeting will consist of the following topics, institution and settlement of injunctive actions, institution and settlement of administrative proceedings, resolution, resolution of litigation claims and other matters relating to examinations and enforcement proceedings. At times, changes in commission priorities require alterations in the scheduling or meeting agenda items that may consist of judicatory examination, litigation, or regulatory matters. So that's going to be today. I'm not going to bank on it, but that would be a nice surprise for today, huh? So that's it for this video, guys. That's a newsletter. I'll see you in the Discord. If you're not in it yet, go to the description in this video. And the link to the Discord is right there. Join it, and I'll be looking for you. So I'll see you in there.